this week's lab, we're doing a separation. We're doing it on the macro scale and you see an illustration of what a separation setup looks like with a separatory funnel, often called a set funnel, um, and a beaker for collecting one of your layers. The first thing you're going to do is weigh out your solids and record each mass. You'll be coming back to this at the end of the lab. Um, after you have weighed out each of your solids, you'll mix them together and dissolve them in your ether and put that solution in a separatory funnel. Next, you're going to add sodium bicarbonate to the separatory funnel as well. And at that point, you should have two layers, just like in the illustration on the right. You're going to want to mix these two solutions together. And the way to do that, you stopper your separatory funnel and then invert. So kind of turn it upside down and mix the solutions together. Because we're using sodium bicarbonate, carbon dioxide gas could be forming, so you want to be sure to vent. And you can refer to Travis and Olivia's video on venting and washing and extracting techniques um, to get a better feel for what that would look like before you experience it yourself. After you've done mixing the two layers together, you'll put the funnel, um, the separatory funnel, back in the ring stand, let the two layers separate, and do a careful analysis and to identify the aqueous layer. Remember, you can use the water drop method, um, and you can also just use your knowledge of solvent densities, which, if you feel like you don't have a lot of knowledge, should be, that information should be in your lab book. After the two layers have separated and you correctly identified your aqueous layer, you're going to remove the stopper and drain the bottom layer out, or whichever layer you're trying to isolate. You're going to repeat the sodium bicarbonate extraction process for a total of three times. So you should do it two more times after the first one I talked you through. Each sodium bicarbonate layer can be combined together. So you don't have to create um, a lot of different separate beakers for these extraction layers. After you've done your three sodium bicarbonate washes, you will wash a final time with deionized water, the white tap water in our lab, if you recall. Um, and that wash can also be added to the three sodium bicarbonate layers. That solution you need to carefully label and you'll use this in part four, all right? Also at this point you should be thinking about what could possibly have been isolated in that sodium bicarbonate extraction. You're going to repeat the extraction process again, this time with 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. Again, you will wash three times with the 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide and one time with water after you've done your sodium hydroxide washes. Each water wash is to try to remove out the water soluble materials like sodium bicarbonate and sodium hydroxide if some of them ended up in your organic layers. You will once again combine all the aqueous layers from the sodium hydroxide washes. Those will be used in part five and the organic layer is fine to stay in the separatory funnel. That will get used in part six of this lab. So again, be thinking about what should be in the sodium hydroxide layers, what should be left in the organic layers. Make sure that you have labeled your beakers very carefully so you know which one is your sodium hydroxide extraction and which one is your sodium bicarbonate. Next, you'll move on to what is effectively part four. You'll take the sodium bicarbonate layers and add three molar hydrochloric acid to it. Um, you're going to add the, um, the hydrochloric acid until no more precipitate forms and the solution is determined to be acidic using pH paper. So you're looking for a pH of less than three. Um, what should this precipitate be? What are we doing when we're adding this HCl to it? A lot of times I get asked, how do I know if enough precipitate has formed? I would add my HCl and observe what happens, let the precipitate settle out, get a good feel on how high that precipitate is in the beaker, add some more HCl, again, let it settle out. If you don't notice any more precipitate being formed. If you don't see that volume of precipitate getting greater or your solution becoming even more cloudier, that's a good indication that you have gotten out all of the precipitate that you can. Once you've made the precipitate, you need to isolate it. So you're going to filter the precipitate using a vacuum filtration process and let your crystals air dry. So this will take over the next week. Um, we'll collect the final mass and analyze the purity in the next week so your data won't be due for at least a week. Um, your book doesn't really give you much in terms of procedure for the filtration process and that's because we've already done the recrystallization lab. You're expected to understand and know how to do that. If you're not completely clear, be sure to look at the videos from the recrystallization lab. 
after you have isolated your precipitate from the sodium bicarbonate layer, then you'll turn to the sodium hydroxide extracts. You're going to heat them gently to remove any residual ether that might have um, been extracted into that layer, or maybe you weren't quite careful when you were separating out your layers. You only want to heat it up to about 60 degrees C. That ether has a very low boiling point, and you'll want to do this in a, a hood because your T-butyl methyl ether is very volatile. You're going to allow that to cool back to room temperature and then precipitate your crystals by adding three molar hydrochloric acid to the cooled solution again until your solution tests acidic. So again, think about that less than or equal to three pH. If you end up having an oil form when you add your three molar hydrochloric acid, you're going to want to cool your solution in an ice bath to cause crystallization. Um, again, Look to the flow chart that's in your lab book and in the background information video that I'm providing. Think about what your crystal should be at this point. Um, what happened with the material in the sodium hydroxide extraction and then what could the three molar HCl be doing to whatever was extracted. You will again filter and collect your crystals and allow them to air dry, getting a final mass and doing purity analysis next week. Finally, you're going to go back to the ether layer in the separatory funnel. You'll need to drain that into an Erlenmeyer flask and dry the ether with anhydrous sodium sulfate. Um, dry in this case means to remove any water. It doesn't mean to remove all liquid, so you should absolutely still have a liquid left after you're done drying the ether layer. Um, you're not going to need a whole lot of sodium sulfate. Usually a pea-sized amount is pretty good for the volume that we're working with. You're gonna dry for about five minutes with occasional swirling to ensure that any water that is um, small water molecules that are trapped in the ether layer um, can now be absorbed by that anhydrous sodium sulfate. The sodium sulfate should kind of start to clump together um, because of any water in the solution. And that's a good indicator that your drying process is working. After you've dried your solution for five minutes, you're going to decant, which remember is just a fancy word for pour off the liquid. You do wanna be careful because you don't want any of the solid anhydrous sodium sulfate coming off with your liquid. Once you've decanted your liquid into another container, you'll evaporate the ether off, again, evaporating it in a fume hood. And warm. you can do this through warming on a hot plate while a stream of air blows over the solution. This is one of the micro scale techniques that people will be doing as a makeup lab. Um, you can get more details on page 29 and 35 through 36 in our lab book, but also Travis and Olivia have posted a video showing how to do this technique as well. The main thing to remember here is don't overheat. You don't want to char whatever remains after you have evaporated off all of your liquids. So low heat with the air, blowing over. And of course, the air is simply helping us to get more surface area um, so that your evaporation can happen faster. What should be left is an oily residue. You can crystallize the oily residue. You may need to scratch at it and put it in an ice bath, and you will eventually get the product mass and assess the purity of this material as well. Um, you may, if you notice, we're creating a residue. I would recommend getting the mass of whatever container you are decanting into, that way you can simply subtract out um, the container mass to get the crystal mass um, once you have formed your crystals. Potential errors for this lab, throwing away a layer too soon. Just like in recrystallization, as long as you don't throw anything away too soon, all of your materials are there. Um, all three of the compounds that you weighed out are still there. You just have to be careful with your la um, labeling and also not throw anything away. Um, sometimes people will identify the wrong layer as aqueous or organic, so they will try to isolate the wrong layer and then move forward, um, which doesn't hurt what's in the layer, it's just not going to give you the right results. Um, another common accident or common error that occurs is not making sure that your sub funnel is closed before you put, before you put your liquids in it. So you want to make sure that that stopcock is parallel to your lab bench and make sure that it's closed so that your liquid doesn't drain out of it. As I mentioned earlier, not labeling what your receiving containers are means that you won't know what layer um, came from or which container came from which extraction. 
Um, and so then it's a guessing game from there on out. Be careful with your lab labeling. We have Sharpies in the lab. There's no reason not to label. Um, writing with a Sharpie on glass can easily be removed using water and a little elbow grease. So there's no real good reason why you shouldn't be carefully labeling things. Finally, sometimes people don't add enough acid to get all of the precipitate to form in our two acid precipitation steps. Um, and of course, when trying to recrystallize, if scratching is needed in order to help the crystals start growing, occasionally people will forget to scratch the surface and both of these last two errors yield low recovery results for the products. Remember, this is a lab worksheet, so it's not a formal lab report. Um, you will be collecting your data, making all your observations, and then um, in a week after we have gotten our melting points and our final masses for our solids, you'll go into Moodle. I will have digitized the worksheet, um, which unfortunately Moodle requires me to put down as a quiz, but you'll enter your data into that worksheet slash quiz that I'll put up on Moodle. So we've got a little bit of time. This allows you to focus on um, some of your other formal lab reports um, prior to having to turn in all of this information. Good luck.